Hello, this is Dr. Joe Trout from the physics program at the Richard Stockton College of New Jersey. In this lecture, we're going to talk about Chapter 6 and discuss topics such as humidity, saturation, and stability. First, what's the driving question from this chapter? It's how does the cycling of water in the Earth atmosphere system help maintain a habitable planet. We'll discuss how the global water cycle functions. We'll discuss how to quantify the water content of the air. We'll also discuss how air becomes saturated through uplift and expansional cooling. And finally, how atmospheric stability affects the ascent of air. When we talk about stability, we're talking about the idea that if air begins to move upward, if it's in a stable atmosphere, the forcing will try to force the air molecule back to its original position, if the atmosphere is stable. If I push it out, if I take a parcel of air and push it down towards the earth, the forcing will force this parcel of air back up to its initial position if the, ape, if the atmosphere is stable. And we'll discuss this at the end of this lecture. We're going to start with a huge assumption and that's that the amount of water in the earth atmosphere system is neither increasing or decreasing. Volcanoes and meteors add water to the Earth atmosphere system and photo disassociation of water vapor and chemical reactions break down the water molecules. But essentially it's relatively constant. This fixed quantity of water in the Earth atmosphere system is distributed in three phases among various reservoirs. The largest reservoir, of course, is the ocean, which holds about 97% of the water. Ice sheets and glaciers hold another 2%. Once again, the sun powers the global water cycle and gravity keeps the water from escaping into space. This causes water to fall from the sky as precipitation and flow to the oceans. So our global water cycle looks something like this. We have va evaporation taking place over the oceans and lakes and streams. We have transpiration, which is water that moves up through a plant's roots onto its leaves and then enters the atmosphere again. Here clouds form. Then under the right conditions, precipitation in the forms of rain, snow, hail, and sleet fall back onto the land. Some of this water that if precipitation heads back towards the ocean as runoff. So if you ever notice when there's a heavy rainfall we have a lot of water that stays on the surface and runs down through the sewers and things and it does not seep into the ground right away. Some of the water from the precipitation goes sinks into the soil and we call that infiltration. This is where we can get fresh groundwater from. 
and eventually it ends up back in the ocean and the cycle form begins again. So we mentioned the, verse, the first, the largest two reservoirs of water in the Earth atmosphere system. The first one being oceans, which is about 97%. Then ice sheets and glaciers, which is about 2%. Then groundwater, which is about half a percent. Then lakes, and these are freshwater lakes. Then inland seas then soil moisture, then the atmosphere holds about 0.001% of the water, then rivers and streams, and then living organisms. Note that this small percentage of total water that's stored in the atmosphere, and even though this is a small percentage, this is vital to the weather. Here shows an image from space and we can show, see the water vapor showing in this long range transport. So you can see how the water flows around uh, the earth. The transfer processes, when we have phase changes, this is evaporation so this is where more molecules enter the atmosphere as vapor then return to the surface, the water surface is a liquid. We also have condensation. Here more water molecules return to the water surface as liquid then enter the atmosphere as vapor. Transpiration. We have water that's taken up by the plant roots it escapes as a vapor from the plant's pores. Evapotranspiration is the total of evaporation and transmission and transpiration. We also have sublimation. That's where ice or snow become vapor without becoming a liquid first. And depo deposition which is water vapor becomes a solid such as ice or snow without first becoming a liquid. All three phases of water exist in the atmosphere. So this the phase changes are what bring the water into the atmosphere. Now we have precipitation that comes down as rain, drizzle, snow, ice pallets, and hail. This shows the percentage of precipitation originating from land sources. So note that most of our precipitation comes from the oceans. If we're far inland though, then we have a higher percentage of the rain coming from land sources. Here we see the pathways taken by precipitation falling on land. It falls on the trees and on the ground. It's brought up the, the, through the plant's roots and back into the atmosphere through transpiration. We also get evaporation out of the soil, off of lakes and streams in the ocean, and off of trees and other plant life. Some of it comes uh, down as runoff and enters lakes and streams and finally eventually the oceans again. And some of it is filtered through a belt of soil and we have uh, soil with moisture in it. <laughs>
if we look via pre precipitation and evaporation, the ocean has a net loss of water and the land has a net gain. So if we look at the water bu uh, budget in Table 6.2, the precip precipitation on the ocean is about 85 times 10 to the 15th gallons per year. The evaporation from the ocean is about 95 times 10 to the 15th gallons per year. So there's a net loss from the ocean because more is evaporating than is coming back as precipitation. And it's about negative 9.7 times 10 to the 15th gallons per year. The precipitation on land is about 0.98 times 10 to the 14th meters, cubic meters per year, or plus 26 times 10 to the 15th gallons per year. And evapotranspiration from the land, we lose about 16 times 10 to the 15th gallons per year. So that's a net gain on the land of about plus 9.7 times 10 to the 15th gallons per year. So notice we said that the amount of water in the Earth atmosphere system is about constant. So we're losing 9.7 times 10 to the 15th from the oceans and we're gaining 9.7 times 10 to the 15th gallons per year on the land. So another characteristic of the atmosphere is humidity and that describes the amount of water vapor in the air. This varies with time of year from day to day within a single day and from place to place. We know that in the summer there's a lot of humidity in the air almost can be almost to the point of being uncomfortable. In the winter there's so little humidity in the air that we start getting dry skin and that starts to be uncomfortable. There's various ways of measuring humidity and we'll go through each one. The first one is vapor pressure then mixing ratio then specific humidity, absolute humidity, relative humidity, which is probably the one you're most familiar with, dew point, and precipitable water. So first, water vapor, or vapor pressure. Water vapor disperses among the air molecules and contributes to the total atmospheric pressure the pressure component from the, from the water vapor is called the vapor pressure. One way to measure how much moisture in the atmosphere is the mixing ratio. That's the mass of water vapor per mass of remaining dry air. So if we took a parcel of air, let's say a kilogram, and we took out all of the water and we measured the mass of the water and then we measured the mass of the remaining dry air that gives us the mixing ratio. This is expressed as grams of water vapor per kilogram of dry air. This makes sense because don't forget there's a very small amount of moisture in the environment in the atmosphere. So that's why we measured it in grams of water vapor per kilogram of dry air. We have specific humidity is another way 
to measure how humid it is. This is the mass of water vapor in grams per mass of air containing the water vapor. So this is similar to mixing ratio except that in the denominator, so we're measuring the mass of water vapor divided by the air. In the denominator we count both the air and the vapor. To be honest, the mixing ratio and specific humidity are so close they're usually considered equivalent. Once again this is because there's so little moisture in the atmosphere. We can also measure absolute humidity. That's the mass of water vapor per unit volume of humid air and it's normally expressed as grams of water vapor per cubic meter of air. Now he said in the summer around New Jersey it can get really humid. There will be lots of water vapor, lots of moisture in the air. And in the winter, there's very little moisture in the air. So it looks like sometimes it's easier to put moisture in the air than others. So that brings up the idea of saturated air. This is a term given to the air at its maximum humidity. So what happens is we have a dynamic equilibrium develops where the liquid water becomes vapor at the same rate as the vapor becomes liquid. Saturation may be added to various humidity terms such as saturated saturation vapor pressure, saturation mixing ratio, saturation specific humidity, and saturation absolute humidity. Changing the air temperature disturbs this equilibrium temporarily. So for example, if we heat water it increases the kinetic energy of the water molecules and they more readily escape the surface of the water as a vapor. So I'm sure if you ever put a pot of potatoes boiling on the stove, it's a large pot, and as you heat that water, more vapor, water vapor, enters into the environment of the kitchen. And if it becomes really humid, you'll start to see water condensing on surfaces like the top of the countertop or somewhere like that. So if we heat the water, we increase the energy of the water molecules, they can escape the surface and enter the atmosphere more easily. Here's two graphs that show the variations with air temperature of vapor pressure and saturated mixing ratio. Notice that when we start re reaching uh, zero, where the water begins to freeze, this line splits. What we see is that if we look at high temperatures, we can have a lot of water vapor. So the saturation vapor pressure in millibars comes up to be almost 80. When we get down to 40 degrees C, we're at about 25 millibars is the saturated vapor pressure. And by the time we hit zero, we're down to about 5 millibars. So the warmer the atmosphere is, the higher the saturation vapor pressure is.
Table 6, 3, and 6, 4 show the variation of the saturated vapor pressure as a function of temperature. So if we look at the saturated mixing ratio and we look over water and we're at 50 degrees C we have about 88 grams per kilogram. If we drop down to zero we have about 3.84 grams per kilogram. If we go down to about negative 20 degrees C we're at about 0.78 grams per kilogram if we're over water and about 0.65 if we're over ice. You might imagine that it's easier to get water vapor in the atmosphere from a pool of water than it would be from a pool of ice or a sheet of ice. If you listen to the weather station or the weather on the TV news you'll probably hear about relative humidity. So this compares the amount of water vapor present in the atmosphere compared to what would be present if the air was saturated. Relative humidity can be computed from water vapor or mixing ratio. So if we look at mixing ratio, the relative humidity is the mixing ratio of the air divided by the saturation mixing ratio times 100%. At constant temperature and pressure, relative humidity varies directly with the vapor pressure or mixing ratio. If the amount of water vapor in the air remains constant, relative humidity varies inversely with temperature. So what does that mean? Let's say we have a relative humidity of 50 percent. So the atmosphere is holding about 50 percent of the moisture that it could possibly hold right until it becomes saturated. If we keep the same amount of water and we heat the air, so once again if we keep the same amount of moisture in the atmosphere and we heat the atmosphere, our relative humidity would decrease because what will happen is that our saturation Right, the amount of water the atmosphere can actually hold will increase. If we were to keep the same amount of moisture in the air and decrease the temperature, our relative humidity would increase because the relative humidity depends on the saturation of the atmosphere. And if we decrease the temperature, then the atmosphere can't hold as much water. And the saturation mixing ratio or the saturation vapor pressure decreases. So once again, if we start with a specific relative humidity, say 50%, and we heat the air, the relative humidity might go down to 40%. And if we cool the air, it might go up to 60%. Once again, keeping the same amount of moisture in the atmosphere. So we know during the day, we see this red line, we start at midnight, 
we cool and we're cooling and cooling and getting colder and colder till just before the sun comes up that's when we would reach our lowest minimum temperature after the sun comes up we start increasing then the start, sun starts going down and we start cooling again if we kept the same amount of moisture in the air what will happen as our temperature goes down our relative humidity would go up and as our temperature went up our relative humidity would go down also shown on this graph is the dew point the dew point is the temperature at which the air must be cooled at a constant temperature to reach saturation. By the way, if we have all the, if we're at saturation, then our relative humidity is 100%. So the dew point, once again, is the temperature which the air must be cooled at a constant pressure to reach saturation. At the dew point, air reaches 100% relative humidity because it will, the air will be saturated. It will be higher with a greater concentration of water vapor in the air. So, if there's a lot of moisture in the atmosphere, it's easy to get something to condense, right? Or it's easier for it to reach saturation. With high levels of, of relative humidity, the dew point is closer to the current temperature than it is with low relative humidity. So if we're up around 20 degrees C, our dew point will be close to 20 degrees C if we have moisture in the atmosphere. If the dew point is below freezing, frost might form instead of water um, um, being formed. So we call it, the dew point is usually it is referred to as the frost point. So if we look at precipitable water, that's the death depth of the water that would be produced if all the water vapor in a column were condensed into a liquid. It's of course highest in the tropics. Note these two graphs show the precipitable water. And the first one is for the monthly average from January, um, for January from July 1983 to June 2005. The bottom graph shows the monthly average for July for that same time period. Notice that the maximum values are in red. That it gives you at about 6 to 6.5 centimeters. And this occurs around the tropics. How do we measure humidity? So a hygrometer is what we use to measure the vapor concentration of the air. A dew point hygrometer uses a temperature controlled mirror and an infrared beam.
So what happens is you hold the mirror and you cool the mirror until condensation forms which changes the reflectivity of the mirror and it alters the reflection of the beam. These are probably the most common type. Originally we used to reach we used to use hair hygrometers so that relates changes in the length of a human hair to humidity. So not much, having much hair, this isn't a concern to me, but you'll often hear people with long hair saying they're having a bad hair day because it's so humid. And what happens is that the length of the human hair actually changes as the humidity increases. A hygrograph provides a record of the humidity variations over time. And probably a less precise method is the electronic hygrometer. So this is based on changes in resistance of certain chemicals as they absorb or release water vapor to the air. This is probably the easiest one to use, however. And here we see the temperature dew point sensor, the hygro thermometer used in the National Weather Service automated surface observing system. There's also something called the sling psychrometer. And what it really is is two thermometers. One of the thermometers is wrapped with a little bit of cloth called a wick. This wick is placed in distilled water and then you swing both of the thermometers through the air. What happens is, is that as you swing this thermometer through the air, the wick dries and the water evaporates. It took energy to get this to to happen. So what happens is that thermometer with the wick now shows a lower temperature as it's being cooled by the cooling action of the vaporization of the water. An aspirated psychrometer does the same thing but instead of swinging the thermometers, which you can imagine can be kind of hazardous, you use a fan and blow air over the two thermometers. So the one without the wick tells you the air temperature and the one with the wick cools as the water evaporates and gives you a different temperature. So what you do is look at the wet bulb depression, that's the difference between the dry bulb and the wet bulb temperature, and the temperature of the dry bulb. So for example, if we're at 20 degrees and there's one degree difference between the wet bulb and the dry bulb thermometer, then the relative humidity is about 91%. We can also get the dew point if the temperatures are down below freezing. We can also monitor water vapor from satellite imagery. So the IR imagery uses infrared wavelengths to detect the water vapor. And the water vapor Im images indicates the presence of water vapor above about three kilometers or about 10,000 feet. Right, so about one and a half miles roughly. So the whiter the image, the greater the moisture content. In the top picture, you can see a hurricane and see how all this moisture gets wrapped around this hurricane. So it makes like a comma shape. <laughs> 
So how does air become saturated? Well, as relative humidity nears 100%, condensation or, or deposition becomes more likely. The condensation or deposition will form clouds, and clouds are liquid or ice particles. Humidity increases, number one, when we keep the amount of moisture in the air constant and we cool the air. The saturation vapor pressure decreases while the actual vapor pressure remains constant. Therefore, the humidity is going to increase. Or, another way to get humidity to increase is just to add water vapor into the air at a constant temperature. What we see is as ascending saturated air, so relative humidity above 100%, expands and cools, the saturated mixing ratio and the actual mixing ratio decline and some water vapor is converted to water droplets or ice crystals. So if you remember back in chapter 5 we talked about the adiabatic process. This is where we have a process where no heat or other energy is added or subtracted from the system. So during an adiabatic process no heat exchange between the air parcel and its surrounding environment. Don't forget when we talked about air parcel we said a given number of air molecules. So think of it as a balloon full of air, but the balloon's not there. This, by the way, is called a conceptual model, like we talked about in Chapter 1. So if we have expansional cooling, so if you remember, if we said this expands, it's going to cool. Or compressional heating, so if we compress the air, mullet, the, uh, air parcel, it's going to warm. And if we have this expansional cooling and compressional heating of unsaturated air, are referred to as an adiabatic process if no heat is exchanged with the surrounding. So air cools adiabatically as it rises. So we have a lower pressure with altitude allows the air to expand. So if I take a warm humid air mass, it starts to rise up through the environment. As it does, it expands because the pressure around it is lower and as it expands it's going to cool. So if we have unsaturated ascending air it's going to cool about 9.8 degrees C per kilometer. And it warms at the same rate upon descent. Once again this is called the dry adiabatic lapse rate. If it's saturated the air continues to cool as it goes up but the moist adiabatic lapse rate is 6 degrees per kilometer. The reason is because the latent heat is released from the condensation of the partially offsets the cooling as the partial rises. So air parcels are subject to buoyant forces caused by density differences between the surrounding air parcel and itself. So for example if you take a beach ball and you force it to the bottom of the pool and you let go of it, the reason it becomes buoyant is because the density of that beach ball, the mass per volume, is less than the density of the water that it's in. So it gets buoyed up to the top.
buoy it up to the surface. If we have a stable air, then the ascending parcel becomes cooler and more dense than the surrounding air. This causes the parcel to sink back down to its original altitude. If it's an unstable air, and I take an ascending parcel, it becomes warmer and less dense than the surrounding air, and this causes it to continue to rise. Okay, so this is the idea. Let's say our actual air, the temperature is decreasing as this purple line. So what's happening is we start at the surface at negative 10 degrees C and if we go up a kilometer we're at 0 degrees C. So what's going to happen? This is a stable air environment. So if I take a parcel here and I send it up the atmosphere, so let's say it's at about 5 degrees C, if I force it up a little bit, So let's say we force it up one kilometer. Its temperature is going to decrease. And it will now be colder than the surrounding air. It will sink back down to its original position. If I go in the other direction, what's going to happen is if I go, if I move it down a kilometer, it's going to be warmer than the surrounding air. It's going to get pushed back up. So when we say the air is stable, what we're saying is there's no ver vertical mixing. So if I try to force an, ar an air parcel up, it'll return to its initial position. If I try to push it down, it'll return to its initial position. If we have an unstable air, so here the dotted line shows the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So we drop about 10 degrees each kilometer. So about 10 degrees each kilometer. And let's say we have something that's dropping even more than that. So here, let's say we start at about 35 and we go up to a kilometer, we're at about 15. So now what's going to happen? I send this parcel up a little bit. It warms and cools, but it's still warmer than the surrounding environment. It keeps going up. So it expands and cools again, but it's still warmer than the environment. It goes up. So in this case, if I perturb an air parcel, and start it moving up, it'll continue to go up. And if I try to force it down, it'll continue to go down. So unstable air enhances vertical motion, where stable air tries to fight vertical motion. We talk about the soundings of the atmosphere. This is actually an old Navy term. If you can imagine if you're sailing a ship, the ship is has some water at the bottom in the bilge, but you want to make sure that the ship isn't sinking, so you keep measuring this amount of water. And what you do is drop a line down with a, a weight attached, and all of a sudden you'll hear it when it hits the water, it'll make a little splash. So we Old sailors used to refer to that as taking a sounding. 
So we still use the term today, and then here we use them for temperature profiles, and soundings are temperature profiles of ambient air through which the parcel is moving. So soundings, and hence stability, can change due to local radiative heating and cooling. So at night the ground cools and destables the overlying air, and during the day the warm ground warms and destabilizes the overlying air. We could also have air mass advection, so an air mass is stabilized as it moves over a cooler surface and the air mass is destabilized as it moves over a warmer surface. We could also have large-scale ascent or descent of air, so subsiding air becomes more stable and rising air generally becomes less stable. So we can talk about absolute instability this occurs when the air temperature is dropping more rapidly with altitude than the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So don't forget, the dry adiabatic lapse rate says that it drops about 9.8 degrees every kilometer. So if it's dropping faster than that, we say it's absolutely, it's an absolute instability in the atmosphere. We also have conditional instability. This occurs when the air temperature is dropping with altitude more rapidly than the moist adiabatic lapse rate. So that's about 6 degrees per kilometer, but less than the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So in this case, the air is stable for unsaturated air parcels and it's unstable for saturated air parcels. So during this conditional instability where the, where the temperature is dropping in the atmosphere faster than 6 degrees per kilometer but slower than 9.8 degrees C per kilometer then we see that if, the, if I have an air layer if I have a parcel that's unsaturated, the atmosphere would be stable. If an air parcel that was saturated had a lot of moisture in it, it would be unstable. With absolute stability, the air parcel is stable for both unsaturated and saturated air. So it doesn't matter if the air parcel has a lot of moisture in it or not, the atmosphere is still stable. We also have neutral air layer. That's when the rising or descending parcel always has the same temperature as the air surrounding it, the ambient air. This neutral air layer in a neutral air layer the air is neither going to impede nor spur upward or downward motion of the air parcels. Okay, so here's the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Here, the temperature drops 9.8 degrees every kilometer. Here's the moist adiabatic lapse rate. So A is unstable for both clear air and cloudy air, and we call that absolutely inst an absolute instability. B, the temperature is dropping between 6 degrees per kilometer and 9.8 degrees per kilometer. We say this is conditionally sta stable, so it's stable for clear air, it's unstable for moist air. Finally, if we look at C, here the temperature is still dropping 
but it's less than the 6 degrees per kilometer. So this is stable for clear air and it's stable for cloudy air. So this is an absolute stability. If we look at D, here the temperature remains constant all the way up through the atmosphere. So we say this is isothermal. And it's stable for clear air and stable for cloudy air. With E, what we're seeing is that the temperature doesn't drop as we go up into the atmosphere. Instead, the temperature increases as we go up through the atmosphere. This is known as an inversion, and it's very stable. So, if I had air moving up through the environment, it would be, as it moves up, it would be colder and more dense than the air above it or the air surrounding it, it'll be forced back down to the surface. We show this stability on a Stuve diagram. Here we have temperature is the horizontal axis increasing from right to left. I'm sorry, from left to right. So it goes from negative 40 to positive 30 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, Celsius. And the pressure is one vertical axis and the altitude is the other vertical axis. So if we get an updraft, updraft what we see is we're going to get warm, moist air from the ground. It's going to move up through the atmosphere. It's going to expand and cool. If there's moisture in that air parcel, eventually that moisture is going to either turn into water droplets or ice crystals, and clouds will be formed. And of course, if we're losing air down here, and there's an updraft coming, there has to be a downdraft coming to fill in that missing air. So how does the air start to move up to the environment? One way is a frontal uplift and it occurs when contrasting air masses meet. This la leads to expansional cooling of the rising air and possibly cloud and precipitation development. So first let's think of a cold front. Cold front comes crashing through. It pushes that warm moist air ahead of it up off of the surface of the earth. It cools water can either turn into water droplets or ice crystals and clouds can become formed and it can begin to rain. In a warm front what happens is the cold air kind of recedes and the warm air replaces it but as it adva advances as the warm air advances it's going to ride up and over the cold air and the leading edge of this advancing warm air at the Earth's surface is the warm front. Another way we can get air to start moving up, or another lifting process, has to do with what the shape of the surface of the Earth is. So for example, if we look at moist, warm air coming off the Pacific Ocean, it starts moving inland. It hits the mountains, it goes up. The air expands and cools, and clouds are formed. Now it might rain, 
and that air has now lost its moisture. And what we end up with is a dry leeward slope. So first on the windward side, the wind the side that the wind's blowing into, we have a moist windward slope, clouds form, and then a dry leeward show, slope. Okay, so just in summary, we talked about how we measured the humidity and we talked about what a stable and understable atmosphere is. And finally, we talked about these lifting processes. All right, so thank you, and we'll see you next time.